Good evening and welcome to the Carolyn Holt Show. Well, I think that song is pretty much true after the election. You got to keep your head up because it really doesn't matter at the end of the day, uh, even though we elect a leader, um, he may not be popular. So uh, keeping your head up is just a, a good thing to know and to do, no matter who's in the White House. But um, I know that there is a lot of uh, concern out there in America concerning uh, the election. And um, we may have some fireworks still before um, December 19th, I think is when they uh, solidify everything. So, um, but keep your head up because that's very important no matter what is going on. And tonight, to help you keep your head up, I I'm gonna talk about how the media, uh, they influence uh, uh, pop culture a lot. And uh, we have certainly seen that in the election cycle that uh, just finished. I have with me tonight as my guest, um, Professor Shalandis Williams. Um, she is the uh, adjunct professor for University of Phoenix and their mass uh, communication uh, course that uh, talks about the influence uh, of media on popular culture. And I'm gonna bring her in in just a moment. But before I do that, I want to tell parents about a math tournament that is happening on December the 3rd. It's in the city of Carson. Now this is for people who live on the uh, West Coast uh, in Los Angeles in particular, but this math tournament is something that you don't want your children to miss. Um, it is uh, sponsored by Professor Ron Glimp, uh, who created the game Math Maze, and he is having a tournament for the children on December the 3rd. So parents, I um, ask that you talk to your youngsters and uh, do all you can to get them to the tournament on December the 3rd. It'll be well worth their while. It'll be well worth your while. And it's a win-win situation for everybody. But the game is so useful and so helpful in terms of um, putting the right foundation in place for um, young children uh, in terms of math. And I believe we have a lot of scholars out there that have just been uh, dormant. So we wanna untap and unleash all of that potential. And you can do that. Uh, not only uh, do I suggest that you bring your children to the tournament, I suggest you buy the game as well because it's a game that the whole family, the entire family can play. And, and we don't have a lot of things that the entire family can do anymore. So it's very important. So December the 3rd, I'm going to be there and I'm going to play the game and I'm not going to cheat. It's going to be fair and square, unlike perhaps the election, but we won't talk about it. <laughs> but I'm going to come and... Um, participate and I would love to see you there. Again, that's December the 3rd and it's in the city of uh, Carson at the Carson Community Center. Well, uh, tonight's guest, um, she, as I mentioned earlier, she is a uh, professor at the University of Phoenix and um, uh, tonight we're, we're talking about uh, media's influence on uh, popular culture because it is amazing how much um, we are influenced by the media and perhaps we don't even know that. So, Professor Williams, how Hi. are you? I am wonderful. You are wonderful. Okay. Well, I am too. And I cannot wait to get uh, started uh, about tonight's discussion. And before I do, I'm going to say I have to confess I'm going to be a little bit biased tonight because you are my niece. So uh, I'm, I'm going to let people know that up front. But uh, how are you and um, what's going on? Well, I just wanted to say thank you so much for this opportunity. It's not every day that your aunt calls you. And, and 
platform for you. So I really appreciate that. And I'm um, just excited to kind of share with you uh, one of my great passions in life, and that is media and all things communication. So, so I look forward to this evening. Oh, well, you know what? You are just the sweetest thing this, high, this side of heaven, and I, I just so appreciate uh, you saying yes to uh, doing the show tonight. And so I, I guess the, the best place to get started is to share with us a little bit about your background because you are certainly well qualified to uh, talk about such, uh, such subject matter because you yourself are a former uh, anchor woman. And uh, in terms of being an anchor woman, uh, in, for those who may not know, the whole point is that um, you are doing the news and establishing a trust factor with your audience because people trust the anchor to know what they're saying and to know what they're doing. So um, how, how did you get uh, interested in, in news in the first place? What, um, what kind of sparked your interest? Really, as a child, just watching the news, I watched a lot of news, as did my grandmother at the time. So um, when I go to her home, I mean, we would sit in front of the television waiting on that newscast <laughs> to come on so that she could get all of her news for that day. And uh -huh. it was an exciting time. And I remember just watching the anchors and kind of seeing how they, um, you know, pro projected the news and the information and just really thinking, hey, that might be something I would want to do one day. So, um so that's kind of how I got into it. My career or my education actually started where yours did at the University of Texas at Austin. Mm -hmm. While there, I majored in business and then later on pursued a master's degree in journalism. Okay. I, I, um, I started actually at CBS in Dallas where I did some behind-the-scenes work and kind of went out with the reporters. And then I also um, just kind of, kind of learned the ropes, I guess. Mm -hmm. I then got my, my first full-time uh, job in the Texas Panhandle. So I covered te the Texas Panhandle, the Oklahoma Panhandle, and eastern New Mexico. And I was the reporter at the station. I was the producer, the Saturday executive producer for all of the shows. <laughs> and, and I answered as well. So um, in that market, you basically get the opportunity to do whatever you do, <laughs> whatever you want. That's right. So, so I basically worked in all areas of the news. And actually, while I was working as a reporter, that's when I started teaching on some of the online courses for the University of Phoenix, and then later on moved into the actual classroom when I when I moved to a city where they had um, a lot of the ground locations. So it all kind of came together like that. Wow. I tell you, uh, you know, um, the other thing that we have in common is that one of the most trusted news men in America, Walter Cronkite, okay attended the University of Texas. So, um, you know, he, he, he thought it was, he went there because we went there. <laughs> so he said, you know what, those, I, I love those ladies, and so I'm going to do what they're doing. But no, uh, but uh, Walter Cronkite, he has the reputation of being one of the most uh, trusted uh, news anchors uh, ever. And um, and I understand that I, I think uh, during that time that perhaps news was presented in a, in a way it was very, you know, matter of fact, no uh, entertainment uh, value whatsoever. And so I think that's why people felt that they could trust him. So um, and I did because I do remember when uh, the president, John F. Kennedy, uh, was shot and and Walter Cronkite share that news with the nation. So I do know how important uh, the role of an anchor is because if you can build trust, um, people will stop what they're doing. As you said, sitting in front of the TV with your grandmother, people will stop what they're doing to hear your take because they're trying to determine if what they're hearing is truth. So um, there is a lot of responsibility associated with being an anchor. Right, right. I wanted to go back to Walter Cronkite. One of the texts that we teach from uh, media and culture 
and mass communication in the digital age, it actually said that Walter Cronkite started to slightly speak out against or actually boldly speak out against the Vietnam War. And that was actually a motivating factor when we started withdrawing. Uh, oh, from okay. That. I did not know that. That's now that's that's an interesting uh, piece of information, that he had so much uh, uh, power, that not only could he make a a decision as a, a person delivering news, but to be passionate about the uh, the direction that the country was going in, uh, that he felt that the populace needed to be um, informed about right. what was going on. Right. And I think that's one of the main ways that our, our culture has been changed by the way we actually receive media and receive the information mm -hmm. um, from these media is before, you know, a few decades ago, Walter Cronkite was it. We would sit as a family many times in front of the television set. We'd wait for the news to come on, kind of like my grandmother did, like I mentioned. Um, and we wait for the news to come on and... Um, watch it as a family and that would be the way we get the information now we're in a 24-hour news cycle so you're, you have cable news channels 24-hour uh, news channels you you're able to get information from social media people are actually creating information for you to consume and not just the media outlets but individuals have the freedom to go out and create that information so um, it, it's, a, it's a totally different time period we're living in. And even with the, the digital video recorders, you know, we do what's called time shifting. You don't have to be in front of your television set at 7 or 8 p.m., you, you know, in the prime time viewing hour to watch. You can be at a, a baseball game for your kids and then come home and watch your programming at 10 p.m. So um, just with that, I think that, that's one of the main changes, just how we consume the news and when, when we consume it, which is pretty much every second of the day. <laughs> Yes, because, you know, it, it's uh, delivered to our cell phones. Um, I have the, I think it's the Samsung Edge. And, um, you know, at any moment, the, the news feed is going across uh, the screen of my telephone. So, okay, I'm getting, I guess, some feedback. Okay. Um, so, so, you know, the interesting thing is that News now is literally at your fingertips, whereas uh, during the era of uh, Walter Cronkite, you had to wait for it to um, be delivered. And in the next segment, we're, we're going to talk about that, um, how stories get delivered to you, how, how they um, form, how they come about, and uh, who they are designed to um, influence. So uh, we're going to go to break. Uh, but I want you to stay with us, and we'll be right back, okay? Okay. <laughs> Master and math can be big fun, fun for you and everyone. Play it each and every day. Master math the easy way. <laughs> Sing, play it. Uh. Math Maze. Why not turn math time into fun time with Math Maze, the new game craze. Get yours today at mathmaze.us. Mom, now you can help your son master math and have big fun. Play it each and every day. Master math the easy way. We'll say that play Make sure your child owns the skills necessary for success in high school algebra. Get, Get it, it now. now. MathMaze.us. MathMaze.us. And now you can help your daughter play it like you know your daughter. Play it each and every day. Master Math the easy way. Say it. Play it. MathMaze. MathMaze cards contain both Spanish and English. Get yours today at MathMaze.us. That's MathMaze.us. Attention, mothers and sons, fathers and daughters. Come join the 2016 Math Maze Game Tournament, Saturday, December 3rd, 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. at the Carson Community Center. Win trophies and great prizes while playing a card game that helps your kids improve their math skills. Mothers, bring your sons. Fathers, bring your daughters. Register online at mathmaze.us or call 310-697-3177. Sponsored by the Academic Preparation Squad, a California 501c3 nonprofit. A long, long time ago, 
I can still remember how that music used to make me smile. And I knew if I had my chance that I could make those people dance. Thank you so much for joining the Carolyn Holt Show. Welcome back. Uh, this evening, I have as my guest, um, Professor Shalandis Williams. Uh, she's from, she's an adjunct professor with the University of Phoenix, and uh, she teaches uh, media and the influence of media on popular culture. And we're, we're talking uh, to her tonight about um, news and uh, how news gets uh, delivered, because she also is a former anchor woman, so she understands the behind the scenes of what it looks like uh, regarding uh, the news. And uh, one of the things I, I think that people perhaps they don't consider in terms of how influential uh, news is, is news editing and the editor who determines uh, the stories that get on the air. So would you uh, share with us a little bit about uh, that process and, and the decision to put certain stories on the air? Sure. Well, of course, life as a reporter was, was pretty exciting every day. There's a different story. Maybe one, two, two percent of the time did I know the day before what I would be covering the next day. I mean, generally you get into the newsroom, you have your news meeting with a team, and then the assignments are made so every reporter, every photographer knows what they're on that day. Mm -hmm. So before those decisions were even made, though, um, we had a file folder. You're, you're constantly getting these press releases. Um, you're, you're getting everything in, and then, you're, you know, the assignment's desk is in tune with the police scanner and everything that's going on. So you, you get all your information together, and you decide what you're going to go big on, so to speak, or what you're going to put a reporter on. Mm -hmm. and then you go out, you know, you go out with your photographer, typically just a one man, uh, you know, one to one, one reporter, one um, photographer will go out, unless it's a really big story, um, and, and cover the story for that day. You do your interviews, and then when you come back in, you, you write your story or you, you write it in the news band sometimes and send it back. And um, at that point, <laughs> that's kind of where some things get lost on the cutting room floor. <laughs> 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 Uh, the managing editor at that point, before anything is voiced, before a reporter goes into the booth to, to voice a package, mm -hmm. before the word is, is, is voiced or before an anchor reads anything, um, an, an editor looks at it and um, they, they nick, sometimes they nick part of the, the quote you use called the sound bite of course. Sometimes they'll ask for more, you know, more of an explanation and so they'll kind of rewrite some of what you've written. So some changes are made uh, sometimes. Uh, sometimes the news director, if it's a story that might be more controversial or something major, the news director might even get involved to look at looking at the final, the final um, script for it. So it's pretty involved. Uh, at least I would say three to four uh, pair of eyes will look at a story before it goes on air, mm -hmm. and, and that's just in a regular a regular news market. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, also they always talk about how, especially here in Southern California, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, I'm not sure that's the uh, thought all around the country, but I do know uh, that's what it's about here. Because sometimes I hear stories and I'm going, well, why are they telling this? This story is not even in Los Angeles. But they don't always clarify that because I guess it's, too, it's all about drawing the eyeballs um, to your particular channel. Right. It's all about newsworthiness. I think timeliness, something that happened a little more recently will probably be higher up in, in the list. And mm -hmm. so producers pretty much manage it, as you know. Yes. <laughs> the order of the show, so to speak. They get to what we call stack the show. So that's one of the things I enjoyed about being a producer. Um, you, you're basically deciding where you want what to go. And, of course, in the newsroom, you're constantly monitoring. You have all the, 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 the screens up, so you're monitoring what your competitors are doing, and you kind of see, like, oh, this, this section led with this, or they led with that, so you kind of know what they're doing. But typically, in any major news market, the top three to four stories will be the same story, um, just in, maybe in a different order, but they'll be the same stories. And so... Um, 
So, yeah, it's a pretty interesting process, but, of course, there are, are always gatekeepers to mm-hmm. the story that come back intending to present in the newsroom or intending to, to pass to the anchors might not be the story that actually airs, and, and that's just the fact of of news, television news. Well, you know, also uh, the other, I guess, knock uh, that uh, television news sometimes get is that most, uh, up until I would say 10 years ago, uh, newspapers, um, they were the the go-to source because of the content and because they felt that more detail, um, uh, uh, when I say they, audiences and people who subscribe to a, 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 a newspaper uh, that you get the details of the story and you really uh, find out because in a, in a news uh, story you only have what three three minutes at most to uh, present it from beginning to end and get the story straight so to speak That's a stretch. <laughs> typically reporter packages you get one one thirty a minute thirty or mm-hmm. a minute eight seconds Oh, okay. Okay, so three minutes then is no longer. I mean, that's a long story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, because I've, I, I have a background in, in print as well. I used to work for, I guess, one of the most famous newspapers ever, and that was the Los Angeles Herald Examiner. And um, one of the things that we were told, and this has been uh, verified by a friend of mine who's a reporter here in Los Angeles, that... Um, Content is king, especially for for print, because people feel like uh, in 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 television they're just getting a snapshot of whatever the story is really about. But uh, there's this notion that the content of the newspaper solidifies whatever uh, story has been uh, brought to the forefront by uh, television. It gets solidified in terms of um, uh, in terms of the newspaper because you can get the details and who said what without um, with objectivity. So, would you agree with that? That uh, newspapers are more objective than yeah. television. Well, I, my bias will come into play. I'm sure, but. <laughs> No, it's okay. I, I, it's a, you know, your answer will, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to accept w- whatever you say. But in my opinion, because of the images, the video, mm-hmm. um, just almost you feel like, especially the local television anchors in, in local markets, uh, a lot of the viewers feel like they, they kind of know them just be, because of all the nuances that you can kind of put into television news. Exactly. It seems to be a bit more compelling to me, even with the shorter sound bites, you still get to see where they were when they said it, how mm-hmm. they said it. What, mm-hmm. what the, so the, the picture yeah. is what adds the, uh, the yeah. same depth yeah. that the content does with the words. I, and like I said, I am biased, but there are a lot of people who historically, they, they feel like newspapers, Speak truth to power, mm-hmm. and if you print it in the paper, especially on the front page. They feel like it's true. And the other thing about paper, like you said, a one minute, fifteen second piece will not be nearly as in depth as a three page article. So, uh, or the ability to write three pages, or how, and now with it, of course, with the internet, it could be as as long as you'd like. So, um, so yeah, there are, there are differences in the dis, in the dis two media medium. But I feel like um, each has its own its own positive. And, yes. Uh, that would be it for newspapers. Some people just, like you said, they historically have trusted newspapers more. Mm-hmm. Than well, you know, the other, but the other, I guess, new kid on the block is social media. And um, now I say, when you really take a look at things, um, it's the immediacy that uh, social media satisfies because it's not always about content content is important but it is as you said it's when you're able to get it so the readiness i guess associated with uh, social media has a lot of influence and especially among younger audiences Uh, the belief is that their attention uh, span is shorter and and i won't say that that's the only reason but 
it just makes sense. If, if you can deliver something and deliver it accurately, um, why not take advantage of the opportunity to do so and then let the um, subscriber decide when they hear the information, but, you know, make it available whether they're right. able to take it in in the moment or not. Right, and with news report, with television, there's always been some sense of urgency. If you start on a story at 9 a.m., no matter what, something is going on air at 5 p.m. <laughs> okay. <laughs> pretty quickly. Uh -huh. business. But imagine with newspapers, you typically have pretty much a full 24-hour period before you have to print and deliver that paper. And now, tele I mean, I'm, and now the Internet has completely changed that. They also must update their information as the stories become, as the information becomes available. They're online, online constantly updating that. And so um, I, I don't think newspapers have declined. I don't think they will ever die out. They've basically just moved to mostly being online and, and getting a lot of online consumption at this point. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the other media forms, they've converged onto our cell phones. Um, talk about media convergence. The old forms of media don't die out. Radio um, was here, but television didn't come in and replace radio. Basically, um, it, it just adds to what is here. So with the with cell phones now, they call it the fourth screen. Mm -hmm. um, movies being the first screen, and then, of course, um, television the second, and then our, our computers the third. So now we have the fourth screen with the cell phones. Mm -hmm. Basically, everything's accessible on, on your phone now, and, um, and all, all forms of media. So, um, so yeah, that's one one huge change. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the, the goal, I guess, um, of media in terms of influence, and, and I would like to certainly say that in this uh, last uh, election cycle, it certainly had a lot of influence, and it still does, because um, the pictures that are now coming in as a result of the um, election really shows um, something that I guess has been denied for a long time, and that is the great division in, in this nation. And with these pictures that you get to see, like you said, with a 24-hour news cycle, you can, you can see this information any time. Um, I, I think it has... Yeah, there were times within the last week I've had to unplug from Facebook completely. <laughs> oh really? Now now why was that? What was what was behind your decision? After about forty eight hours of complete election coverage from non news outlets, you know, just for individuals, uh, Facebook friends and, and family members commenting on the, the election results even before the election the election, just encouraging people to get out and vote. It, just everything concerning the election. After a while, I think it was all consuming. Mm -hmm. and so, um, so uh, yeah, I kind of unplugged for for a little while just to to get kind of get away from that. Well, and and you know, I I I think not only did you have to do that. I think a lot of people have. And and the other problem uh, that, and I won't say necessarily a problem, but the concern is that um, the effect that it's having on children. Um, you know, adults can, because they've lived long enough, they can kind of put things in perspective. And as you said, they can unplug and they can uh, do things to make uh, hard things a little easier to deal with. But the children are left trying to understand, well, wait a minute, what, what happened? And trying to um, explain news uh, to children can really be a challenge because uh, I guess they are like a captive audience. And um, it's kind of uh, left to the adults to really explain a lot of things. Not that we have not had to do that in the past, um, uh, because some of the, the great news stories just in the last, uh, you know, 20 years um, have uh, really um, had children um, engaged. But not only children, um, you and I, we talked uh, this evening, we, we were talking about some of the cliches that happen uh, regarding the news. And and one of the stories that came up was the O.J. Um, Simpson trial. Mm -hmm. And uh, the cliche that dealt with that was uh, the trial 
of the century. And a lot of uh, people struggled with what to tell um, their children when the verdict of uh, not guilty came down uh, for O.J. Simpson, even though in the, I guess, in the court of public opinion, which uh, media helps to establish, he is still guilty. <laughs> the trial is not over. <laughs> And they didn't get it right. So um, the the influence, I, I think, is um, sometimes it, it's hard to even be measured because it the effect uh, uh, crosses so many um, so many areas, and it is I, I guess it's just it's kind of in if you are a parent. You are responsible for, um, I guess, explaining a, a lot of this, and and with the the notion of the trial of the century, with the the pictures saying one thing, I guess the presenters of news saying one thing, your parents offering up their opinion. I, I can understand why children would be confused or would be. Um, uh, I guess uneasy about you know what's going to happen next. So, right, and actually with the with the Simpson trial, I was a teenager at the time, so I, I kind of remember following it and mm -hmm. listening in the conversations and, and trying to kind of follow that. But um, as far as just media in general, it's important too for parents to not get disengage. Mm -hmm. Most of, most parents are on social media and they're participating. And looking into this, but uh, the average child now at 12 has their own smartphone. So if they're walking around with all of this information at the ready, they are going to get these messages, and it's up to the adult to kind of make meaning out, of, make sense mm -hmm. out of the information that they're getting, and then telling them how it affects their family immediately, how it affects their lives, mm -hmm. and kind of put things in perspective. Because you, you even I'm even hearing media reports about these children going to school and they're upset, and, and other students are saying things to upset them. And so I think it really falls on the parents to put everything in perspective and and um, and just kind of let them know what's going on and and, and what if any immediate effects there will be. Mm -hmm. but, um, one thing that I wanted to bring out about the election, too, is that now I think the total is at $2 billion, and that supposedly is the amount of free or supposedly free um, media coverage that um, now President-elect elect Donald Trump received. So when you think about the, the field of candidates, they started with 16 Republican candidates for the office. And I remember even like a year ago, they were complaining. There was frustration because the other, some of the other candidates felt like, hey, it's not always good press or good news. Mm -hmm. but he's getting more coverage than we are, and that matters. And so now just to look at the end result, I can only imagine what some of, what some of the, the candidates are, are saying at this point, the previous candidates that were still in the cycle a year ago, you know, what the, their view on that is. Right. Now, did, what was the dollar amount? Two billion dollars is the last um, is the, the last report I heard. That was just earlier today. Uh huh. Two billion dollars. If he had paid for it, it would have cost two billion dollars to get the same airtime he received, um, just naturally. <laughs> uh, well, well, he he received it. Be I guess being uh, pro provocative is is that yeah. kind of the the notion. That was part of. Or outlandish, or outspoken, or irrational, or any other. <laughs> <laughs> Any other adjective that you might want to throw in there? There's an adjective after adjective, right? But um, and of course, he, he was a media personality prior to any of this, so um, basically, he probably had that skill and that talent for knowing how to get media coverage and, and kind of what to say and what to do. Well, not only uh, not only how to get media coverage and what to say and what to do. I I have to say this about Donald Trump. I, I don't think that you or I would have ever been able to apply for a job with absolutely no experience in terms of politics or the military and uh, not only receive entree to 
uh, be heard, but to actually end up uh, winning an office. Um, I, I, I'm stunned, I must say, at the fact that this man had no experience. So, again, another cliche. Uh, it says that people saw him as the ultimate outsider. Well, I think uh, we as Americans, we have to make up our minds because you can't legitimately have one set of standards and rules for the populace and then one man can change the whole game and you go, oh, wow, that was brilliant. I, I just don't know how we can um, be okay with that. Because I know that if I apply for a job and I say, well, you know, I want this job, but um, I have no experience and I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do when I receive this job, I, I really don't think <laughs> that anybody would hire me. <laughs> so I'm, right. I'm still stunned at that part, is that uh, being an ultimate outsider somehow is the biggest entree. And so uh, I, not, not only I know am I scratching my head, I think a, a lot of other people uh, are doing the same. So, uh -huh. in, in some of the Sunday morning news programming, one of the things they said, and of course Bernie Sanders' name will, will come, come up again in this type of discussion, but they felt, like people who are looking at this thing objectively or attempting to do so, mm -hmm. they felt like this was a year of change. This was a year um, where Americans wanted something different, anti-establishment, anti-insider, anti-Washington. And so they were, they were moving in that direction. And, of course, uh, Bernie Sanders has been in, in Washington for quite a while, but, but as far as he, he was not a typically typical establishment, he was not the typical establishment candidate. And so they were saying that the Republicans heard the cry from the people that we want something different, we want something else, and that the Democrats failed to do so. So that's one idea that's kind of been kicked around um, just about. And they even go back, they were like, you know, President Obama was, was brilliant, he was smart, he did all the positive things that people said about him. But even in 2008, people wanted something new, something different, and he was that, something fresh. So, um, and, and I'm, as you know, I'm a news junkie, so I, I take all of this in and kind of process it and, and look at it. But um, those are some of the things that are that are being said. But um, with this election cycle, too, I think one of the – because I saw your, your previous um, show the, – the, you were About the stress. About the stress. Uh-huh. Election and, and part of the stress of it, I think, was just all of the mudslinging and all of the bringing up past um, transgressions or alleged trans transgressions, and all of that just got to a point I think where people were were kind of tired of that and wanted to hear more about the issues or more about the future of the country and less about the personal issues. But um, there's a book that I use uh, when I teach my class. It's called Feeding Frenzy. How Attack Journalism Has Transformed American Politics. Mm -hmm. That book, um, it's by a, he's a media scientist, a political analyst, Larry um, S S Sabato, Larry Sabato. But um, basically it talks about like there are three, there were three phases of, of the different types of political journalism. So the lapdog journalism phase, the watchdog phase, and the junkyard dog. So with the <laughs> <laughs> it starts like 1941 to about 1966. And so, you know, there was a time of war for the country. Mm -hmm. And basically at that time, journalists were, were said to have basically sat at the lap of, of politicians at that time. And they laughed at what they said, and then they regurgitated it to the people just as they had, had received it. And it was a wartime necessity at the time. They didn't want to give any, anything away. They had to be very patriotic and they served and reinforced the political establishment. Mm -hmm. so then during the watchdog era, things started to happen. So 1966 on through mid, the mid-70s. So then you have Watergate and the, the Vietnam War is going on. And so then you start hearing about the about private lives of, of candidates or politicians. Mm -hmm. And they start checking, you know, checking their behavior. So that's when it started to kind of creep in 
to politics, and now we're in the junkyard dog phase, uh, according to this book. And that, that started like in the, the late 70s, basically. And it's basically where anything goes. Everything is fair game. If you're running for office, if you're a politician, somebody who, who might do something um, deceptive or, or you know, something in their, in their private lives may be, might be likely to do that in public life, their public life too. So everything makes the news. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so it's just interesting to think about the, the different cycles. And I don't know that I've seen another cycle, so this is all I know. <laughs> the present is a junkyard, the junkyard yeah. dog phase. <laughs> this, this phase that we're in. And, and one uh, theory behind it, too, is because we talked about the 24 hour news cycle. If you have 24 hours to fill, you're going to fill it with something. Mm-hmm. So it, it might be outlandish, as you said. Uh, it might be, you know, you're going to fill that time. So that's one theory behind why so much junk. Makes the news. I was just going to say, um, well, in, in terms of uh, influence, media, it, they are supposed to educate and they're supposed to entertain. And and I think uh, this in this particular uh, election cycle, they did do a lot of entertaining. Uh, I'm not so sure that we were educated really on the issues that we should uh, uh, be concerned about. Um, the uh, la- the young lady who was, I guess she was the campaign uh, manager or advisor, Kellyanne. Uh-huh. Yeah, she she articulated uh, his platform much better than I heard him do. So I, I think they, they perhaps should have had her uh, in the forefront uh, mm-hmm. from the very beginning so that people, because I, I believe this, that if you clearly articulate something, I think uh, most of the people can get uh, behind it, especially if it sounds like truth. So if either if both candidates are talking about uh, issues that concern uh, people, I think that that's really what they want to hear. Um, this notion that uh, the nastiness is what uh, really determines the election is probably true, but um, unfortunate. Uh, because, uh, you, as you know, Hillary uh, Clinton made the comment that she felt that the uh, director, James uh, Comey, the FBI director, uh, really affected her campaign and uh, perhaps caused her to lose in the last what five days um well that that, that's a possibility but i believe this that if you really um if if it's really about change and you really state things that people see as change i don't think it matters about your uh, political affiliation because if, if people really want change, as they said they did when uh, President Obama took office because of the war, they wanted to do something differently, I think that that is for any uh, campaign. Change is change is change. So um, I, I just hope that we get past that, that we even have to worry about what party the person is from. I, I think it's it's much easier to focus on our these issues that are being discussed um, beneficial to the American people. I I think that's where the discussion should go. Well, we're going to go to break, and when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about the influence, and then we're going to talk about something fun like how to get an A in your class. Okay? (laughs) Sounds good. All righty. Bye-bye. Master and math can be big fun. Fun for you and everyone. Play it each and every day. Master math the easy way. Sing, play it. Uh. Math Maze. Why not turn math time into fun time with Math Maze, the new game craze. Get yours today at mathmaze.us. Mom, now you can help your son. Master math and have big fun. Play it each and every day. Master math the easy way. Sing, play it. Math Maze. 
Make sure your child owns the skills necessary for success in high school algebra. Get, Get it, it now. now. MathMaze.us. MathMaze.us. Now you can help your daughter play it like you know your daughter. Play it each and every day. Master Math the easy way. Say it. Play it. MathMaze. MathMaze cards contain both Spanish and English. Get yours today at MathMaze.us. That's MathMaze.us. Attention, mothers and sons, fathers and daughters. Come join the 2016 MathMaze Game Tournament, Saturday, December 3rd, 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. at the Carson Community Center. Win trophies and great prizes while playing a card game that helps your kids improve their math skills. Mothers, bring your sons. Fathers, bring your daughters. Register online at MathMaze.us or or call 310-697-3177. Sponsored by the Academic Preparation Squad, a California 501c3 nonprofit. That is what I want you all to do for me. Bang! What you're looking for the same thing. It's a new thing. Check out this. <laughs> okay, you know, perhaps he should have been campaigning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining the Carolyn Holt Show tonight. Um, I have adjunct professor Shalandis Williams uh, from the University of Phoenix with us as our guest. And we're talking about how media influence uh, popular culture. And you were sharing with me a story um, about um, the, the uh, death of Michael Jackson. And and it it really, from what you share with me, it really solidified for me how th this issue of trust. Um, so if you don't mind, would you uh, tell the story about um, TMZ right. and uh -huh. CNN? Uh -huh. uh, in two thousand nine, August two thousand nine, about two months after Michael Jackson's death, I was at a conference out in Tampa, mm -hmm. and so there was a panel discussion about it and about the news coverage of, of his passing. And so there was a representative there from CNN and there was one from TMZ and, um, and a couple of other people. But the, the focus was on these two outlets because TMZ is credited with breaking the story. Mm -hmm. They would be the first outlet to say this, this happened. And then, um, and then later on, CNN and some of the other outlets did report it. But what, what was interesting, one person stood up in the audience and they said they, they remember TMZ breaking the story. They said, yeah, TMZ broke it, but I did not believe it until I saw it on the CNN ticker. And so with that, basically that shows you that CNN has more credibility. And basically the representative from CNN said they, they debated that. Should we go with this now? Do we wait until we get com you know, complete confirmation that this has really happened? And so they decided to wait. They decided to wait, and as we know from the presidential election in 2000, that does not always happen. Um, there's something about being first and about the immediacy of news coverage that, that's appealing to, to media outlets. But, um, but CNN decided to wait. So in, in media, there's always the issue with, do we, are we going to be right or are we going to be first? Mm -hmm. you can't have, have it both ways. Then there, you always have to kind of make those decisions constantly. So. And and when you think about it, though, if if the intent is to um, promote trust, uh, I guess being right is more important. Uh, but there are a lot of promos when they do the promos for these uh, different organizations. They do say, "Get it first, right here." They don't always say, "Get it first and correct." They just say, "Get it first. So. Here's you'll see only on channel you know. <laughs> yeah 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 join us tonight because what we're going to tell you you're not going to see it on any other station which is probably true I, i'm not saying that part is, is 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 not true but uh getting it first is is that really uh the i guess the hallmark of journalism or is the hallmark of journalism to get it right so i guess the individual uh, watching the news or taking the news in uh, has to make that decision. Mm -hmm. 
But um, the the other thing, just uh, 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 on a lighter note, I I wanted to um, find out with uh, these um, wonderful students that you have over at the University of Phoenix, I, I wanted to know now if, if I decided to uh, sign up for your class and I get everything I need together, how is it that uh, I'm going to walk out of there with an A? What what do I need to do uh, to well, Convince you that I am worthy and I've earned an A. Well, it, it, just to be clear, if you show up for my class now, you will have to teach that night. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Expert that you are in this particular field. So, um, but no, one thing, I, the main thing is I want them to show me that they are media literate. Mm -hmm. And media literacy is, is just like when you think of literacy, can you do you understand what you're being exposed to? So when they leave my class, when they when they listen to a song, or if they see they're watching television pro programming or something on cable, or if they're watching the news, especially because mm -hmm. um, that's that's my key area, then I want them to understand what they're being exposed to, why they're being exposed to it, mm -hmm. what are what are possibly the motivations of the person or the entity who created the content mm -hmm. and just have that critical thinking ability to, to question things and not just experience them. I want them to be able to, to question so they won't be easily persuaded. And so they can look at something and kind of dissect it. Like we've done on this program tonight, just kind mm -hmm. of pick it apart and say, well, um, what can they benefit by showing me this or presenting this or, or so just, being able to just look with a critical eye, I think, and, and absorb all of their media with a critical eye. Okay. And um, I also understand that you are a stickler oh, for yeah. standards and in, in, yeah. in particular writing. Uh -huh. No run-on sentences. <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, you know, that's that's difficult right. for, for most people because they write the same way they talk. And if you listen to people talk, most of them are. They are a big run-on sentence. So. Right. And I, I'm a stickler on that. And I actually had students tell me they appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I do. I mark everything. Now, the points I did, I might not deduct a point or two or, you know, for for everything, but I do want them to know just going forward, you know, just to make sure they're familiar with the, the rules of grammar and just and writing. It's, in, it's important. And it, like we've always heard, it's important in any career they'll later speak. So mm -hmm. I just want to make they know before they leave my classroom. And the other thing, um, with this particular class, I teach some other communications courses and write, basic writing courses as well, but... Um, with media influence on American culture, we all experience media. They are, most of them are on social media. I have students straight out of high school. I have uh, adult learners with families of their own. But most of us are, or all of us are experiencing media at some point. So the class is rich in the, the fact that everybody can participate, everybody can talk about their experiences. And, and um, so it really, it really works well. It's not like I'm standing as the lecturer and, and they're only asking questions. They participate, and it's a heavy participation class, so I love it. Oh, okay. So um, when when they come to your class, um, they can expect to, uh, I guess, get a, a very much a, a well-rounded view of whatever it is that you're doing because of the levels of um, uh, the age group. Um, you, you have uh, people who are just starting to think. Uh, you have people who have... Careers and uh -huh. want to do something else, or, or maybe they've reached a roadblock and they want to further their career, so getting that degree is pretty much the only way that they can move to the next level. I have some people who are business owners, small business owners, mm -hmm. or corporations, but they, they, they want that degree behind them. So, um, so that's the nice thing about it. The class is... is has a various a variety of students from various backgrounds. So mm -hmm. now, now, do you ever have to uh, referee? Because um, th there is this notion that the thinking process for the millennials versus the uh, generation X and Y versus old school versus new school, I guess. So, so do you ever find yourself in the position of having to 
uh, referee? Actually, not really. They, those sometimes we do get into heated debates, and that's always great. Mm-hmm. But they recognize those differences within themselves, and they'll even preface what they're saying with, "Well, you know, I know uh, millennials like me. You know, we think like this, and we do that." And so, <laughs> and then you have the baby boomers in there, and they'll say, "Well, in my generation." This is what we did. This is how we saw things. And then they'll kind of talk about how things have progressed or, uh-huh. you know, in a good direction or a bad direction, depending on what the topic is. So so it really works really well in that in that regard. Um, but, yeah, those, those differences always come up in a, in a good way. Mm-hmm. But but you don't uh, stand there um, and say, now, now class. <laughs> You know, that that's how uh, most professors are viewed as, you know, that you're kind of the uh, overseer of thought. And uh, so, or, um, and, and that your, your, your thought, I guess, is the, is the final one that decides whatever. So uh, that's an course, like I, when it comes to the rules, again, I, I, I'm the stickler, and I, and I am, but when we're in class discussion, I try to go into journalist mode, and that is, be that fly on the wall, mm-hmm. where I'm an observer of, of what's going on, I'm taking it in, and I'm not necessarily trying to, trying to control it as much, but, but, um, so, and so I play both roles, I guess. Oh, okay. Well, no, that, that's, that's very good, because, you know, it's, it's hard sometimes even for professors to be uh, objective, because they are mm-hmm. human beings, so. Um, and, and I think that, too, inherently, we're, we're subjective. Objectivity is the cornerstone or one of the cornerstones of journalism, but you can only be, you know, as objective as, as you possibly can. There, there's no way to have total objectivity mm-hmm. on any issue. Well, well, well. Listening to you, you remind me of Fox News. Now you know their slogan is <laughs> fair and balanced. Now, uh, judging from some of the the uh, stories that come <laughs> come uh, into the news about Fox, I'm not so sure that uh, fair and balanced would describe what's going on over there. But uh, listening to you share with us. Um, how you conduct, uh, you know, your uh, class, that's what it sounds like. It sounds like a fair and balanced class. So, uh, I hope they would say that. I, I think they would say that. I hope so. so. Oh, good. Well, you know what? I, I want to thank you for um, sharing with us and agreeing to uh, be my guest and uh, just talking about how uh, influential uh, the media is in the uh, everyday lives of, of most people, not just uh, Americans, but just uh, uh, people, period. Because news is important. It is, um, it is there to uh, inform us and to educate us and to um, entertain us. Um, and I know that doing that day in and day out is... Um, is not nearly as easy as perhaps some of the reporters make it look. So um, I applaud you for um, training uh, properly uh, what journalism is about and what media is about and the, the great effect that uh, it can have on us as uh, individuals. So I, I thank you and I appreciate uh, you giving us uh, your time and your take on uh, the influence that media has on us as a society. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to work with you on your newest venture. So, so it was exciting that you, you pulled me in, and, and I appreciate it, and, and I enjoyed it, as I thought I would. So. <laughs> well, thank you, my dear. Um, you, um, I, I, I'm in, in the in the coming year. I will invite you back because there are so many other things to talk about. So, oh yes, I've been a fan since the beginning. So, <laughs> all right then. Well, thank you so much, and I want to thank my audience for tuning in tonight. Uh, as you know, on this show, the goal is always the same: to move you from misery to magnificence and from subpar to spectacular. Thank you so much for tuning in and join us again next week. Have a good night.
Mastering math can be big fun Fun for you and everyone Play it each and every day Master math the easy way Sing it, play it uh. Math Maze. Why not turn math time into fun time with Math Maze, the new game craze. Get yours today at mathmaze.us. Mom, now you can help your son master math and have big fun. Play it each and every day. Master math the easy way. We'll say that play it. Math Make sure your child owns the skills necessary for success in high school algebra. Get, Get it, it now. now. MathMaze.us. MathMaze.us. And now you can help your daughter play it like you know your daughter. Play it each and every day. Master Math the easy way. Say it. Play it. Math Maze. Math Maze cards contain both Spanish and English. Get yours today at mathmaze.us. That's mathmaze.us. Attention, mothers and sons, fathers and daughters. Come join the 2016 Math Maze Game Tournament, Saturday, December 3rd, 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. at the Carson Community Center. Win trophies and great prizes while playing a card game that helps your kids improve their math skills. Mothers, bring your sons. Fathers, bring your daughters. Register online at mathmaze.us or call 310. 310- 697 3177. Sponsored by the Academic Preparation Squad, a California 501c3 nonprofit. Keep me up ahead of- 